Well, I guess we can start. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I have to say I'm delighted to have to start our uh, full program with something about the Mediterranean and Sephardic history, which has through the years been very important in the life of Centro Primo Levi. And I want to thank our panelists, Sarah Stein and Ara Rodriguez, for joining us, accepting to take this time um, in a season that has been extremely difficult uh, for everyone and in which uh, especially teachers and professors have spent uh, a, an extraordinary amount of money on, of, of uh, time online, which um, is not always easy. So I also uh, like to start by saying, by wishing everybody good health and uh, um, you know, and, and steadiness for uh, uh, the following, for the coming month. So I will start by introducing our speaker, Sarah Stein is a professor of history and director of the Alan Leaves Center for Jewish Studies, as well as uh, the Viterbi Family Chair in Mediterranean Jewish Studies at UCLA. She's the author of nine books, including Family Papers, which we're going to uh, present tonight, and uh, Plumes, so Streak, Feathers, Jews, and Lost, The Lost World of Global Commerce. So these are two among her books, and there are many others uh, um, that I hope the public will uh, look up and enjoy. She has received many awards, including the Samira Prize for Jewish Literature, Two National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, and the Guggenheim Fellowship, Two National Jewish Book Awards, and the UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award. Aaron Rodriguez is the Daniel Koshland Professor of Jewish Culture and History at Stanford University. He is the recipient of the Alberto Bimini's Prize for Research in Sephardic Studies and the National Book Council Honor Award in Sephardic Studies. He's a member of the American Academy uh, for Jewish Research and he was named Chevalier de l'Ordre de, uh, des Arts et Lettres by the Ministry of French Culture. Um, the French Minister of Culture in 2013. He's the author of several books on the history of and culture of Sephardic Jewry, including the book that stands at the root of uh, the discovery of the Levy family papers. Um, this was called The Jewish Voice from, the Ottoman, from Ottoman Salonica, the Ladino Memoir of Sadi Bezalel Alivi co-edited at the time with Sarah Stein. So this uh, memoir of the, uh, the 19th century patriarch um, is um, the recording of the daily life of a businessman in Salonika and uh, was the first document that attracted uh, scholarship attention to the story of this family. This Levy family had established itself in Salonika in the 18th century and for some, for about 200 years, published books and newspapers. This was a, a very important activity of uh, um, Ottoman Jews, especially as uh, the publishing industry left Italy and moved to other areas of the Mediterranean lands. Um, the, when the world changed dramatically over the decades during which um, the Ottoman Empire came to an end, these are many decades historians uh, deferring their judgment when it started in, but we all know where it ended um, with the with final collapse at the, after the First World War. Uh, the levies scatter throughout the globe, uh, many finding safe haven in countries like India, Brazil, that were marginal to the new order, uh, but perhaps closer to what the, that type of polyglot and cosmopolitan culture the levy news knew. Uh, the family kept in touch through letters. And this book of Sarah Stein um, reconstructs their lives and in many ways, the, the history of 20th century Sephardic Jewry through these letters. Um, I just want to add a, one note that the big archive was, uh, um, is, is, was preserved in Brazil. And it was thanks to Silvia Vieira Ferreira Levy that um, Sara had access to the Strobo documents and could uh, give us the gift of uh, this beautiful story. And so I'll pass the, the, the line to Aaron 
will uh, uh, give an overview of the book and then start a conversation with Tara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia, for organizing this event. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and to finally meet you <laughs> in face to face, even though it's by video link, but also uh, to be able to reach uh, 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 the uh, an audience that is not located in one place, but throughout uh, the country and indeed the globe. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's also a great pleasure, of course, to have this conversation with Sarah Abravayastein, uh, started out as a former student, but is now a, 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 a wonderful colleague and a dear friend. Uh, we have collaborated before, and uh, as Natalia mentioned, uh, we collaborated on the edition of the translation of the Ladino memoir of Saadi, Saadi Bessel El Alivi, which came out in 2012. This was the first Ladino autobiography. It's very rich text. Um, and this, uh, you know, it, it, the, we edited the translation done by Isaac Jerusalemi uh, and uh, wrote an extensive introduction. Uh, writ very rich text of a newspaper publisher and a book printer. Um, and it is, of course, the patriarch of the family. And in many ways, uh, this uh, book that Sarah has written now is a sequel in some ways. To, to that in the form of a family saga uh, of next generation and descendants of Saadi until uh, our own day. Uh, as Natalia mentioned, members of the family, beginning with some of the children of Saadi, began to emigrate by the end of the 19th century. And then this grew apace in the 20th, France, England, Brazil, later Spain, Portugal, India, South Africa, Israel, Canada, uh, the family members scattered uh, in many parts of the world. So first and foremost, this is of course a family history that Sarah has written in her wonderful book. Also it's a diasporic history. In many ways, it's also a global history. Uh, and of course, a major part of Jewish history and Sephardic history. It is a rich text that illuminates so many aspects of all of these kinds of different kinds of genres of hist history and also themes and topics uh, in uh, general history. So um, Sarah started with a treasure trove of letters by the grandson of Saadi who had emigrated to Rio in Brazil. And above all, this book is, well, above all, among many of its qualities is that this book is a tour de force of sleuthing, detective work. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, there were, of course, the original trove of letters that are in, in, in Rio, but Sarah didn't stop there, which many may have at that stage, but traced the recipients and the correspondents, contacted the family members, uh, interviewed them, uh, uh, about their recollections, but also had access to their own documentary material and, and their letters. So what we have here is through letters, a rich network of relations, of correspondence, of ties. Uh, and at the end of it, in a kind of a node, as it were, of all of this, long into the 20th century remains the city of Salonika, which is of course where uh, the Sephardic center uh, which remains the uh, reference point. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting how a lot of the correspondence comes and goes and touches upon Sarka, goes outward from it and then returns to it. It's really a very interesting um, uh, sort of uh, point here to make. Um, of course, um, the Holocaust casts this long shadow with the destruction of this major Jewish center, Sephardic center, but also um, on the family with many, many members losing their lives. Um, and um, it's really, uh, in that respect, it really represents the breadth of 20th century Sephardic and Jewish history. Um, and the book, as we read it, we see a slowly a remarkable composite picture emerging. Uh, a, comp uh, a kind of a microcosm of what happened to the Judeo-Spanish world in the 20th century, of its disintegration as it moved from empire to nation state, 
and dispersion was member to all corners of the world. Um, it is through the family snag saga and the snapshot of the lives of the family members that we understand on the lived level, not only displacement, but also the rebuilding of lives. While most histories of the last century of the Judeo-Spanish world remain at the macro level, this book turns the optics to the micro level, to individual and family lives and brings in the lived experience. And, and as such, uh, it is a moving tribute uh, to a lost world. So I'd like to start by uh, asking Sarah a question um, is about the process of reading and writing. How did you find the letters and how did you contact the, co the descendants and tell us a little bit about the whole process because I think it is so rich and there's so many source, so many letters here. It's in, it would be very interesting to find out how you, you went about that. I'd be happy to start there. And uh, Aaron, thank you for the, your opening remarks, Natalia for uh, your opening remarks and this opportunity and invitation. So grateful to be in conversation here. Um, it is indeed, I think, a book um, that required a lot of sleuthing. Um, I tend to be motivated in my writing by um, the, the pursuit and, and digging up and sewing together of um, lost sources or ignored sources, um, especially those that point to intimate histories. Um, and to tell the story of a, of a globally diasporic family um, required a slightly different kind of sleuthing because uh, it not only required the pursuit of um, libraries and formal archives around the world that would tell the history of a community, Ottoman Salonika and Greek Salonika, um, occupied Salonika during the war, um, and the gathering up of all of the scattered archives of Salonican Jewry, which Aaron, of course, you have worked on as well. Devin Nahr, many others have, have worked on and have became, became, especially after the Second World War, but even earlier, scattered much as did the community itself. But, but for this project in particular, because it was a family history and so much remained in family hands, the sleuthing was different. So in addition to that somewhat more typical, I suppose, historical work of going through organized folders and archives and libraries. Um, I was also going from living room to living room and carrying on email con correspondence, in some cases, phone correspondence with family members over years. Um, and it, some people were easier to find than others. Um, what's striking is that in very few cases could the family lead me to other family members? Because these branches of the family stretching um, across the world, because they once they left Salonika, they went, as, as you mentioned, um, to England, to France, to Spain, to Portugal, to India, to Brazil, to Israel, to Canada, um, to the United States, and surely beyond, and, and some state in Greece. Um, but after a certain point, the migration, we can talk about why they left, but the migration began in the first decade of the 20th century. Um, by the third generation of emigres, those branches had lost touch with each other. And especially after the Holocaust, the Holocaust was of course the ultimate fissure of these generations. So they no longer were in touch across these branches. So I couldn't rely on the family to, um, reconstruct itself. It really required dancing in a sense from one collection to another um, using um, all sorts of tools to try to pursue these lost threads um, across um, you know, marriages, conversions in some cases, changes of name, relocations, divorces, um, Sometimes the, the great historian's tool of Google was, was my friend and helped me tr track down people. This is indeed how I first made contact with the family in Rio. Um, but in other cases, it was um, by reconstructing family trees and um, searching in a very local fashion um, for descendants um, through phone books, um, <laughs> through synagogue registries, 
um, by word of mouth, um, asking other colleagues, uh, sometimes simply visiting the place in question and doing my best. And, and, and sometimes my best wasn't enough, but to find the people I was searching for. Um, the other thing I would mention is that, as I said, some people are easier to find than others. And some of these figures really took years and some eluded me. And um, as I write in the book, there were some family members I, I wasn't able to find in the course of my sleuthing. And of that subset, some actually emerged after the book was published. So it's, it's, it's actually an ongoing story of how these people were, were found, but there was no simple answer. Um, but maybe the last thing I'll say is that I was so graciously received by the various branches of the family who were so generous with the papers and materials they held and were such good stewards of their family history um, that they, not that they made the job easy, but they made the job very simpatico. <laughs> yes, it was, it's really fascinating. There's a prodigious amount of, of work, of course, of digging and uh, detective work. Um, you've done, you've written many books on different aspects of history. This is, I believe, uh, the first family history that you've done. And could you reflect on what that meant and what, what you found about writing this kind of history very much focused on individual members and life trajectories and uh, just uh, it's it's a new genre in, that you have engaged in uh, and it'd be great to hear your, your take on that. Well, I, I have dabbled in all different kinds of um, conceptual frames, I guess I would say. I've been interested in um, cultural history, in print culture, in legal history, in economic history, and um, history of material objects. Um, and family history was something new to me. I think that it appealed to me partly because I realized that um, we have so many family histories about Ashkenazi families, so many multi-generational European and especially East European Jewish sagas that allow us to understand in intimate terms um, the arc of centuries, the arc of especially the 19th to 20th century and the stories of migration, of acculturation, of sometimes um, uh, intermarriage or outmarriage, of conversion. Um, the, of course, the Holocaust and um, uh, loss and trauma and tragedy and reconstruction in its wake. So both for historical scholarship and in fact for fiction, we have a lot of, of such examples that we can turn to as readers, as teachers who are interested in a broad but personal history of the modern Jewish past. But we really don't have anything like this for Sephardic history and, and certainly for the Judeo-Spanish culture. Um, and I think that it makes that story a bit less accessible, a, a bit less human, a bit less intimate. And so I was driven to fill this hole, I suppose. Um, and I should say, Erin, that um, you asked me before about the process of looking for sources. And I forgot to say something important which relates to this question of why, why family history. But after you and I finished our book, um, translating Saadi's memoir, this is the memoir of a, um, of a man who was a, a pillar, a leader, a shaper of Judeo-Spanish and also modern Jewish and modern Salonican culture in the city of Ottoman Salonika uh, over the course of the 19th century. And um, when we finished that project, uh, I remember asking you, what do you think happened to those descendants? Could we ever find out? You know, what, what family saga followed this towering, um, irascible, um, temperamental figures life. And um, I remember what you said to me, which is, do you remember? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I must have you said, you said, well, we'll never know because yeah, the name uh, is Levy. And and who could find Levy? Who could find them amidst the scattered um, levies the world over, which are numerous and um, sort of unmarked in many ways, the historical record. How do you find? So, yeah. so this reconstruction was partly out of desire to answer that question. 
Um, and maybe like all good students want to always prove their teacher wrong in some respect. <laughs> also a hunt to, to say, maybe it is possible. Maybe we can reconstruct this grand narrative, multi-generational narrative um, that has been obscured. Mm -hmm. well, it's interesting how much, of course, chance plays a role like mm -hmm. in all history. Basically, if it weren't really for one very dedicated letter writer, Leon, who is the grandson of Saudi, who kept everything meticulous. It's not only the act of writing letters, but it's their preservation over generations that is really uh, extraordinary over so many displacements. Um, uh, you, I mean, of course, he is based in Rio, but he's also coming and going back. But it's really by chance because a lot of these kind of family histories rely on this kind of repository of documentation. And that, of course, is not only dependent on chance, but also on circumstances where some of these things perish, some of these things are kept, and also on individual temperament, really, yeah. right? I mean, is this, it's the temperament of this person who was kind of almost recreating the, the scattered family through this web of letters. And, and that is the great, great chance of the historian to be able to find that. Yeah. yeah, I think about Leon a lot. Um, he was a, a grandson, as you say. Um, his father uh, was the Uta Fendi um, born David Alevi. His wife, was, uh, his wife, Leon's mother, was Vida Alevi. Um, he left his home of Salonika um, just in the middle of the First World War, first for Paris and then for Rio. And um, began collecting an archive as a very young man. I mean, of course, it wasn't an archive. He, be, he began saving and, and he was um, an obsessive saver uh, and an obsessive letter, letter writer who saved not only the letter, letters he received, but copies of the letters he wrote in many cases, not in every case, but in many cases, uh, over um, nearly 70 years, which is extraordinary. And this was, and Natalia mentioned this in the beginning, this was a kind of archival back, backbone for the, the book that I wrote. But here's something important, which is that um, he, his papers also fashioned a version of reality that suited him. Mm -hmm. And it was very important for me to look beyond his voice and um, not only to say, what did he get wrong? That's a bit of a skeptical way of talking about it, but rather to say, what didn't interest him that might interest me? Uh, and where can we fill in holes that he left open in his archive, whether intentionally or accidentally? And there were in both intentional and accidental holes in that collection. Um, but one of, the, um, one of the things I realized is that sometimes the smaller collections speak volumes too. You know, a very modest um, gathering of photographs can be as precious as a collection of letters that number into the thousands because they convey more intangible, less accessible realities and, and also potentially realities that are less carefully fashioned, uh, less self-consciously fashioned. Yeah. Um, He's a remarkable collector, really, because he also kept textile. He was in the textile uh, business, but he also kept all the specimens, all the samples of textiles, and eventually, you know. And was that a surprise when you found that? I mean, uh, it was an enormous surprise. I mean, it's not a surprise to the family because yeah. they uh, donated this to a museum in Rio, uh, which I visited with one of his um, granddaughters mm -hmm. um, to see his collection, but. He, yes, he saved fabric samples, possibly as obsessively as he saved letters. I mean, one doesn't know exactly the scale that he began with, uh, and certainly not everything gets saved. But um, I think that part of his uh, desire to preserve had to do with the, with the fact that he was an emigre. Um, and not only an emigre, but he was an emigre who left a home that would be forever changed in his absence. Um, it would be transformed from an Ottoman city to a Greek city in the course of the Balkan Wars. 
it would find its urban core and also its cultural fabric destroyed by um, a fire um, in 1918. It would be torn up by first the First World War and then of course, most catastrophically by the Holocaust in which um, the vast majority of his family at home uh, was annihilated. And so my feeling is that part of his thirst to write and to receive letters and to save them, and even to save these um, material fabric scraps that tied him uh, to Europe, in fact, because he imported fabric uh, for the most part um, from, from Europe to Rio, was also an attempt to hold on to a world that was lost to him um, and to maintain ties to a world that was growing ever more fragmentary, including his own family, which was scattering, uh, becoming distant from one another. And as the generations progressed, becoming unknown to one another as they would to the living generations, as they would be now to the living generations. So there was um, more than an, his father, uh, his grandfather wrote out of nostalgia, I think, and, and out of a kind of um, thirst to document, um, partly to vindicate his name. This is Saadi, whose memoir we, we translated with, with Isaac Drusalmi. But he, the grandson, had a different drive, a different engine. They shared a disposition. They shared an obsessive disposition. But I think it manifests slightly differently because the worlds were changing around them for such different reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in some ways, uh, you know, a lot of that change is um, a, a recreation, a, 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 I mean, the whole arc of a lot of what happens to the family is something that is very typical of the Judeo-Spanish world, a movement from being deep embedded Ottoman context and Ottoman uh, habits, Ottoman, uh, very much part of the Ottoman fabric. Mm -hmm to in fact to the whole process of uh, going to Europe or the West and becoming uh, more westernized but also this is a process that begins to happen already in Salonika with the rapid changes in Salonika uh, that is taking place and you know with with the arrival of a different educational system French arriving and all of those kinds of things but so the, the, in, in one particular place you make a whole uh, you, you, you write a very interesting sentence, which I caught. And this occurs when Leon has left Brazil with his wife and who was sickly and they're going to spas in the early 1920s. And they're in Wiesbaden in Germany uh, and they're, they're, they're where they, their son is born. And his mother from Salonika sends an amulet, a kemea, uh, on the birth of the sun and an amulet to ward off the evil spirits. And you write the following, nothing can reveal the brittleness of reinvention so much as a birth or a death. This is a very interesting statement. Could you expand upon that? Hmm. And how that in some ways reinvention, but brittle, but life cycle events like birth or death, it kind of, and then this, Amulet, which is, of course, it's, it's in the middle of this kind of very bourgeois spa, uh, the epitome of kind of European bourgeois sensibilities at that time. Do you, do you yeah, want to it's an, it, yeah, thank you for drawing attention to that sentence. It's, um, it's such a complex um, human lesson, I think, that I thought about quite a lot, that um, the family part of what interests me about the family is through the generations, they always strive to change. They had to, I mean, it's a human condition on the one hand, but they also, they embraced change. Um, back to the patriarch with whom I begin and, and his father and his grandfather, in fact, they were agents of change. They were writers, they were teachers, women and men. Um, they were uh, pioneering students in new educational institutions. Um, they were trying to expand into new commercial markets. They were emigrating to new destinations. Um, they embraced new political forms. Um, in some ways, this is true, I think, uh, across Jewish history. This is a kind of leitmotif that change is the only constant. But on the other hand, this family, perhaps because of their status as cultural elite, even though they were not economic elite, 
they were perhaps particularly um, receptive to, to change and engaged by novelty. And yet, despite all of this thirsting for, for reinvention, um, they were after all human and they were after all um, former Ottoman subjects and Mediterranean Jews uh, in a fracturing world and subjects of the 20th century. And all of these forces were forces that over the course of so many decades weighed and pushed upon them and frayed them at the edges in, in certain respects uh, were forces of, um, of creativity and ambition, but were but also posed just this relentless series of, um, of, of challenges. Um, and, and among those challenges was the challenge of how to remain connected to one's past while still embracing a present and a future. And I think that is what I see when Leon goes with Estherina to this posh spa to, for the birth of, of his son. Um, what more modern place can you choose than to go uh, to Central Europe to have a child in this um, modern medical environment, modern medical birthing and sanatorium? Um, and yet there you are ready to receive the gift from your parents of a blessing in Ladino and in Hebrew and an amulet, which is um, a prayer um, you know, tucked inside uh, something that you can hold on to, that you can wear, that you can pin to your child's clothing or swaddle your child with. Um, something that you can hold the next generation tight with that also ties you to the past. It's just such a profound intersection of um, the embrace of the new and the legacy of the old. Um, which aren't neither of which are static, both of which are constantly, constantly changing. And I think to some extent, what I see as the, the most dramatic rupture for this family, aside from the Holocaust, which is, of course, the single most dramatic rupture, but aside from that, comes to be when a new generation is born that has no connection to the historic homeland, to Salonika. And certainly, who has no historic connection to Ottoman Salonika, which I should say takes until the 1970s mm -hmm. that that last generation goes, that has a co connection to the Ottoman world. We think of it as such an old reality, but but it, you know, some of these who left in 1911, 1912, or 1913, 14, um, they were raised in an Ottoman milieu and educated there. They knew Ottoman Salonika intimately. So I. I see that the passing of that generation as another kind of uh, a rupture, not the same trauma that we see with the Holocaust, but a rupture of such prof profundity that um, divides them from a Sephardic past infused by a Ottoman Mediterranean cultural reality. Yes, well, it's, it's really fascinating in terms of that kind of rupture and the fading of that world over the generations, which brings to mind the issue also of a prime referent of that Judeo-Spanish world, which is, of course, Ladina. Uh, and uh, I remember when, you know, when Isaac Jerusalem was translating meticulously the, the, the original text of uh, Saadi Alevi, um, how this was almost a testament to a kind of a, of a disappeared, disappearing language. And in, in, in this respect, um, do you have, what, what is the relationship to Ladino, the family members, and to what extent uh, do you see it across generations? Because obviously it's clear, and we've talked about this, it's a fading, just as the Ottoman world fades from this family, so does Ladina, of course, because they're in different cultures, new generations are born there, they go to schools there, it's not transmitted by the parents. So could you reflect on that a little bit? There's a lot to say on this, but um, uh, what, uh, you know, it, 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 it would be interesting to kind of bring, um, sort of bring out that, that also loss, I think, of, of this kind of very important cultural marker in this respect. Yeah, well, I mean, one can really track the family's um, 
uh, journeys, cultural and geographic uh, and historic through questions of language. Um, some of the earliest documents that I can find about the family, uh, not the earliest, but among the earlier are inland, you know, including Sadi Vesela Levy's memoir, also including many um, documents that, that his son, the Otafendi, kept for the community in his capacity as um, chancellor of the interwar community of Salonika, um, which bear his signature um, often um, writing in Salatreo, as did his his own father in the unique cur handwritten cursive of Ladino. So this was the language of the home. It was the language of, of the community in the, in the formal legal sense of a community of Salonika. Um, it was the language of intimacy, um, but it was also the language spoken on the streets of this city, which at its height was 60% Jewish. So you're more likely to hear that language than any other. Um, on the streets of Salonika, at least in the Ottoman period. But then with time, um, the Sephardic Jews in general, and, and this community in particular, and this family even more particularly, begins to make new choices. Uh, there is an embrace of French um, beginning in the late 19th century, largely as the in, uh, because of the influence of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is a, a Franco-Jewish organization, Erin, you've written about more than anyone else, that introduces schools in Salonika and across the Mediterranean Jewish world to so-called uplift um, young Jewish um, girls and boys and, and educate them in a, in a French and also Jewish sort of bourgeois mold. And as French begins to become a language of aspiration, um, you see it tracking in the letters that the family writes to one another. Now the letters are, are their French quickly becomes um, native and their language of choice. And yet still it is internally multilingual for a very long time. So a single French letter may have mixture of a, of a Hebrew kind of benediction in it or a Ladino term of endearment, or even an Ottoman Turkish um, phrase when it comes to questions of commerce, let's say. So the traces, the residue of that Ladino, Ottoman, Salonican, Sephardic imprint um, endure even in French in the letters, and yet slowly over the decades, um, Ladino ceases to be um, a language of connection. Um, not so slowly, in fact. I mean, it's already, that is already true by the 19 teens. That is already true. Um, and the Ladino is already being written in Roman script rather than in Salatreo or um, somehow printed in, in Rashi type as would have been a 19th century um, Ladino, especially by this family of printers. So a, a legacy of language, um, can stand, tells its own story, but also stands in for a kind of Sephardic and an Ottoman transformation during this period. Um, and, and even yet further over time, beyond French, the family is embracing other languages. Those who move to England, of course, will embrace English. Those who move to um, Brazil, Portuguese, Spain, Spanish, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so diaspora becomes further kind of inscribed in language choice and language usage. Um, such that this family's collection of letters, um, looking over the arc of a century and, and the globe, is so multilingual. I mean, they are to, to tell their history, one has to read in many, many languages, not, not just this one ancestral language. Um, but to, to speak of Ladino is indeed, I think, in this family's history and more generally in terms of the Sephardic history, is to speak of um, a fading legacy and to, to tell a story of, of cultural loss and displacement. Much as I know there is um, a current zeal to study the language and embrace it, um, it, does, it did not, it ceased to live for the family as it once lived. And I think that is really the ultimate measure of its vivacity and, um, and lived status. Yes, well, in that respect, it's quite clear, as I think I mentioned at the very beginning, but I think what you're saying is going along the on those lines as well, is, is this family history is in some ways a microcosm of that whole decline and fall of that Judeo-Spanish world of the Levant, 
you know, being transmuted through migrations, diaspora, and indeed destruction um, uh, into uh, uh, entirely new, different kind of places. Uh, in this respect, you know, it's it's it's. Um, how does one um, have you reflected upon uh, how? one writes this kind of history from the vantage point of disappearance, especially when the Holocaust looms so large and devastates the family. How did you, how, how did you grapple with that? I mean, I think we all as historians writing about history of Jews, whether it's Sephardi, Ashkenazi or anywhere else, it, we really have to deal with the enormity of, of the Holocaust. And sometimes, of course, this becomes a telos, the teleology. And it's, it's kind of very hard to, get away from it and not see everything leading up to that. So I'd be kind of like, for example, at some moment you kind of, there's this bizarre moment when Leon in Germany thinks he should change and Germanize his name, Levy to, with a W and in a, mm -hmm. in a German before version. The, before and the Second it, World War. Mm -hmm. uh, such before the Second World War. And it's such as in mm -hmm. the twenties, it's such a kind of shock to kind of even face that, and at that moment, one immediately thinks of the Holocaust uh, in that respect mm -hmm. of how bizarre that would have been. So, or what, even the fact that the moment you were responded to earlier that they he goes to Germany um, yeah. to a spa to have that's his right. first child. That's right. um, well, um, the Holocaust is unavoidable as a central um, chapter of this family's history of Jewish Salonika and of Sephardic history. Um, and woefully, um, the Sephardic experiences of the Holocaust have been neglected, uh, whether actively or, or, or unthinkingly in a lot of scholarship on the Holocaust. But of course, these communities experienced it in, um, with, with catastrophic levels of, of destruction with Greek Jewry and Salonican Jewry in particular, experiencing the highest rates of annihilation of any single Jewish community in Europe. Um, and this particular family lost dozens, not only those who stayed in Salonika, but also those who had earlier emigrated uh, elsewhere in Europe, especially Paris, who then fell under the Nazi uh, dragnet and would be deported as foreign Jews um, living in uh, either um, Vichy or in occupied, uh, directly occupied France. Um, but it was very important for me to tell a longer story I didn't wish to shy away from this chapter because it is so pivotal and still so undertold, but I didn't want it to be the end because it wasn't the end for this family. I also didn't want it to be the beginning because it wasn't the beginning. Um, so I wanted it to be as trauma is, which is something that individuals and families experience and suffer from and also, um, while not all branches of family or all family members survive, some do, and those who survive are left struggling with survival, with reconstruction, uh, with reparations, um, with rebuilding, um, and with reinvention. And so I carry the story forward um, to the 1970s, partly to see what Sephardic means, what Salonika means to them, what this history means to them in the decades after the war. Um, and as um, readers who've already had a chance to peek into family papers might know, there's also this horrible story here of a family member who abets the Nazis as the head of the Jewish police of Salonika. And dealing with that discovery, that tragedy is, is also um, a part of their wartime and post-war story. Natalia, do you want to weave in any questions at this I, point? Yeah, I think we could uh, begin to open to some uh, uh, question from the public. And but I I do have a question because that, what we hear a lot about you know fading culture and fading tradition and this history that is um, getting to its uh, sunset, whether it's the language or the the memory, and. I wonder if the concepts of loss and of um, oblivion and of dis dislocation um, really do justice to the history or are uh, seen, reinterpreted retrospectively 
uh, from the viewpoint of the Holocaust. Uh, I mean, if we look back at centuries of uh, Sephardic history in the Mediterranean, and we're looking at the long lasting empire of the, of the, the Western Levantine world, mobility, relocation, um, exchanges, uh, children were shipped out to marry and to do business all the time. I mean, I think that the idea of the family unity, the way in which is conceived within the culture of the nation state did not apply. So, so it, it is, people moved a lot. People did not, uh, with, I mean, going to another place and setting up business and, and family was not necessarily displacement and loss in the way in which we perceive it today. Does this, this clash of, of meaning? I think it, it could be, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, and I think what's so striking to me, what I discovered from this family, and I, and I knew to be a truism, but I think watching the family's experience of, my, of emigration changed my thinking about this, is that people leave for so many reasons. It's easy to forget that and to think it's a story of aspiration, but they leave out of optimism. They leave to put, give their children new experiences. They leave to, to tackle new um, economic opportunities uh, or you know, make their way into new markets. But sometimes they also leave in disgrace. Sometimes they leave because they have no options at home. Um, sometimes they go back before the, the, the Second World War. Sometimes they go back, maybe because it didn't pan out so well for them in their chosen new adopted home, or maybe because they still, before the Second World War, still felt their home to be a vibrant place. And the other thing, of course, is that many stay, many don't leave. Um, and among the descendants of, of the family that I follow here, there are some who, who stay as Salonika tr is transformed around them not only from an Ottoman to a Greek city, but from a, a majority Jewish to a Christian city um, from which Muslims have been uh, forcibly emigrated through the population exchanges. Jews have begun to leave through um, emigration and have also been um, kind of displaced as a, as a majority for various other reasons, partly as the state seeks to, to Hellenize and Christianize the city. So, this question of movement is such a complicated one. And I think what's so interesting about looking at it through the history of a family is you see that even within a nuclear family uh, or an extended family, that migration does mean so many things for so many people, uh, the motives and the results. Um, and I found that fascinating and, and surprising. Right. So thank you. Someone was asking about what happened in Salonika uh, between 1914 and 1919 uh, that caused um, Leon so much movement. And right. So well, so the city, yeah, the city experiences the city and the Jewish community experience unprecedented change in a very condensed period of time. Balkan Wars first um, transformed the city from from Ottoman to Greek and quickly thereafter, the, the cultural and urban fabric of the city start to be forcibly changed um, to remove the traces of an Ottoman presence, of a Muslim presence um, and of a Jewish majority presence. Um, the First World War brings uh, soldiers, many, many soldiers um, to the city. It, it tears it apart. Uh, the fire that I mentioned before um, destroys its urban center, um, which is also its Jewish center, including the port and the main um, neighborhoods around the port. And all of this is a huge strain on Jews. And additionally, specifically around the time of the Balkan Wars, many Jews are afraid of the transition from Ottoman to Greek rule. Now, some will stay and invest themselves into the Greek cultural and political fabric, some will, including members of this family who work for the state. But, um, but many Jews and many members of this family fear what that transition means. And they, they fear rightly that a transition to national rule will be accompanied by a rise in anti-Semitism. And they're not wrong, mm -hmm. they're not wrong. So these are all 
forces of push. Um, additionally, because of the e economic and um, demographic changes, and actually um, also um, sort of cultural geography of the city itself, Jews find themselves experiencing less economic opportunity in this city. So these are all reasons that people leave. And the number of people who leave in this family across generations is, is quite remarkable. And um, maybe they left in greater numbers because they were middle class relative to Salonika's Jewish poor, who would probably be less likely to leave. But and yet they were indicative of many community members. Um, and Jewish intellectuals of the period um, from about the time of the, you know, or before the Balkan Wars, through the Balkan Wars into the First World War are terrified that the Salonic and Jewish community will be torn apart, will be eviscerated, really diluted by emigration because they will, they see that the community will no longer be what it once was and that Jews will lose their voice, their voice in their city and in their new state. Uh, these aren't all the reasons. There are other reasons that people leave. Um, there's one woman whose story I tell in this book who leaves earlier because she is um, being trained to be a teacher for the Alliance Israeli Universelle, and her name is Rachel, and she goes in the 1890s as a teenager. She leaves Salonika to go get training in Paris and then proceeds to teach in schools all across the Mediterranean and Middle East. She, she journeys an enormous swath as a young as a young Ottoman born Jewish woman in this period again who wasn't of the economic elite even though she was part of the uh, a kind of cultural elite so um so movement so very complicated but I hope that answers the question about um, no, I mean it also the fact that Leon goes to Brazil I mean in, in that at that time Brazil is probably the destination of one of the largest waves of emigrate Ottoman emigrations across the three religions so he goes to a place where Ottoman culture becomes a national culture to these days. You know, in Brazilian culture is so imbued with that heritage. And well, so do, yeah. have you looked into this, I mean, the choice and whether, because I mean, the, the, the Turkish market in Rio, it, you can see the streets of the, you know, the, the Christians, the Jews and the Muslim and the, it was almost yeah, I mean, his, his journey um, to Rio is follows family and is about commercial opportunity and also is, I must say, about a kind of failure at home. So it's not just desire, it's also desperation. He is dealing with an unhappy marriage, um, with uh, a, a son who is quite ill, um, with a wife who I describe as a seeker who sought um, medical and um, therapeutic interventions as, as part of a life's um, searching, I think, for contentedness. Um, so he was um, on the lookout for economic opportunity, which he found in Rio, but he was also leaving a world in which he didn't have a place. Um, so again, we see this, this question of how movement has so many um, aspects to no, it. Well, so of course, in a, collapsing, in a collapsing society uh, th that I'm sure that, you know, Jews suffered as much as everybody else. Yeah. Now we have a question here uh, okay. from Isabel Hendrick, Hedrick. And she's asking um, as someone more, uh, that if, mm. how much information about your project research and research questions do you share with the family members? that is the subject of your book. Yeah, um, and I see from Isabel's question that she's also working on a family history uh, right. for a dissertation project. Um, there is of course a very elaborate methodology of oral history. Uh, and I don't must say, I, I must say, I don't really consider myself of this school of being um, a highly um, methodologically sophisticated oral historian, but I do engage in oral history. And um, I am always very clear that my goal is to, it is as what it is. I mean, it, it, it tends to evolve over a research process, but you, in most cases it was that I was writing a book. Um, um, and I, um, some of these people read the manuscript before it was complete. Um, I was always fascinated what they knew about their history, what they didn't know about their history what was told to them, what wasn't told to them. Um, 
And I would say that one of the extraordinary things about this research process was that they were um, so welcoming to me that I came to feel a part of the family. I mean, many of these so-called research trips were um, had over many hours long meals, sometimes with one of my children <laughs> in attendance because um, the life of a, of a working mom is such that that does happen in the course of a, of a book project that takes a decade. Um, but with their family, with my family, um, it, it is an intimate process. This isn't, um, it is scientific, but it isn't a, a, a cold science. And so I would say that um, I had different relationships with different people, different of these, these subjects had different relationships to their own past. And yet, um, in many cases, I felt that we were learning together about the family history. Um, and there's just something I want to share, although it's really only tangentially related to Isabel's question, which is to say that I write in the book that it always surprised me that the family I met along the way did not ask to be introduced to one another across continents and countries and, and generations, um, even though they knew that I was meeting their distant cousins through my research. And I thought that I, um, I thought that story was told. And I write about that in the, in the epilogue to the book that, that, that I was curious that it was not, it didn't feel to them or so it seemed to me as intimate as it felt to me as the researcher and the writer. But lo and behold, um, just last month, the family convened a, um, a Zoom reunion uh, under pandemic conditions, bringing together all of the disparate branches that the book kind of unified narratively um, with members of this extended family representing, I think it was five generations uh, across six countries gathering together for the first time over Zoom. So that to me is also incredibly interesting when Isabel asked, did I share my hypotheses with them? They also helped me change my uh, interpretation of the past because I think the book, in fact, um, altered their relationship to one another. I like, thank you. I like to ask Aaron to um, close with um, maybe some personal consideration on conducting uh, research with personal testimonies. I think that's uh, one of the biggest challenges of historians and yet such a crucial um, element of, of your work. Well, I, I, d I haven't really done work on personal testimonies in the, way, in the way Sarah's book has done because as I alluded at the very, very beginning, um, uh, th there is, um, there's a kind of, you know, a lot of uh, general history remains at the macro level about what appears to be impersonal forces. And in all my historical writing, I've written about these kind of big processes. But there is obviously, and this is true for every historian, but it's particularly true uh, in this kind of subset of what we're dealing with. There is, of course, a personal element of how one writes about that kind of history. And that's perhaps is what you're also alluding to. And I think it's kind of very interesting because obviously we are long past the day when uh, there was the kind of attempt of the historian to remove himself or herself from the story and to be dispassionate and cold. I mean, we aspire to, of course, um, you know, not be biased. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's kind of an interesting as I reflect upon doing and writing the history of the Judeo-Spanish communities in multiple for forms, um, I, I think it's a dialogue. It's an internal dialogue in many ways. It's a, a, a moment of reflection and there's a reflectivity. I mean, one is writing and one is zooming out and, and then there is a constant dialogue about oneself in relation to this enterprise of writing. And, and I, I find myself actually as years go by even more involved with that than I did at the very beginning. 
I think that um, there's more of a tendency, it's now in fact much more acceptable to put oneself in some ways into the story. I think we've always been doing it. It's just that I think there are all kinds of interesting new uh, challenges and themes of kind of writing about the past, uh, as I said, in dialogue with oneself. And that is really, I think, especially writing about this kind of world that is now all but gone, um, it, there is there is room for rumination, reflection, and a co inner conversation, let alone conversations with others, of course, uh, about this kind of whole process. So in some ways, history writing uh, can become a, a very personal uh, act as well, a kind of a, a, a very a powerful uh, personal mm -hmm. act of, um, of, of, of engagement with the past. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you both. And I hope um, we can perhaps continue some of these conversations on uh, Mediterranean Sephardic history. Uh, I think there is a lot that uh, the public um, wants to know, a lot that you are studying and that is uh, slowly coming to fruition. So um, thank you. Thank to everybody who uh, took part. Thanks, Sophia, for uh, making this happen. And um, I look forward to seeing you again at uh, Centro Primo Levi. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Erin, Natalia. Thank you. We will send you, um, I mean, there were a lot more questions. Um, I, I, I think it's time to wrap it up, uh, but we will send you questions so that you